plugged in, hopefully. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, the Port Outreach Committee. Um, the uh, the focus this this month, um, Renee is going to give an update kind of on on trucks and and the effort we're making on developing the clean air plan. That's going to be later on. Um, we've got a great presentation on the Green Marine. We just went through our second certification, so we've got our certifier here who's going to um, walk through that process. Uh, and then we've got Todd DeYoung as well, who's going to talk a little bit about um, grants. So, Karen, would you like to go through yes. the roll call? Sure, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's start with um, Fern. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, my name is Fern. I'm with Environmental Defense Fund, um, 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 an air quality policy manager there based in Oakland, California. Right. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Fern. Uh, next, let's go to Mark Rasmussen, if you could unmute and introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Mark. I'm with the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. I'm the uh, new compliance manager for the Northern region, which includes the port area. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with John Cadret. He was the previous manager, so I'm taking his place. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to attend the meeting, um, check it out and introduce myself to all of you. Great, thanks Mark. Thanks Mark. Uh, next, let's have Jolene introduce herself. Hi, Jolene Hayes, I'm with Fair and Pierce. We've been working on the truck access study for the East Complex. Thanks, Jolene. Uh, next, let's have Scott introduce himself. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Scott Wall with the California Air Resources Board, and I am the assigned uh, AB617 or Community Air Protection Program liaison to the community of Stockton. Thanks, Scott. Next, let's have Jonathan introduce himself. Uh, Jonathan Pruitt. I am the Environmental Justice Program Coordinator at Catholic Charities. Thanks, Jonathan. Next, we'll have Barbara unmute and introduce herself. Maybe. Uh, hi, uh, Barbara Berrigan, Perea, Restore the Delta. All right. Next, let's have Davis unmute and introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Davis Harper here, formerly with the Climate Center and I am now a project manager for Edge Collaborative. Good to be here, good to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, next, let's ask Margo to unmute and introduce herself. Hi, I'm Margo Prouse. I am um, a resident uh, and a member of the AB 617 steering committee. Next, let's have Nicole unmute and introduce herself. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Nicole Densberger. I'm with the Air Resources Board. Um, I'm on the regulatory side, primarily ocean going vessel regulations. So excited to be here. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, next, let's have Maria unmute and introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. Maria Mendez with Stockton Unified School District, and I'm also uh, a member on the uh, AB 617 committee. Thank you, Maria. Uh, next, let's have SB introduce herself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I was having a little bit of trouble here with the internet getting on, but good afternoon. My name is Esperanza Vilma, and I serve as the executive director for the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. Thank you. Thanks, SB. And then um, all others are either presenters or um, court staff or commissioners. Wonderful. All right, real quick, I did just want to highlight um, three port commissioners that are here, Commissioner Atwater, Commissioner Treza, and Commissioner Duffy. Wanted to thank them for their uh, participation. Um, our port director is in transit right now. We're all kind of working our way back down from Vancouver. We were at the International Association of Ports and Harbors 
uh, meeting earlier today. And so um, some folks are still in transit and, and others are getting ready for the, the state of the city tomorrow. So, um, but I'm excited that uh, we can have our, our port commissioners here. Uh, and also, I think you guys know Jason Cashman, uh, Karen Romero, and Julia Botello from port staff as well. Okay. Um, the uh, I did want to I uh, just here in SB just kind of made me think of uh, participation at Earth Day, which I thought was was pretty tremendous from um, everybody. The job that that they did to get folks out there. I know Jonathan, your team was out there. I think the uh, the kids and the the I call them kids, but the students from um, UC Berkeley uh, were out there. Um, somebody from the the Air District was there, I, and I thought it was really well attended and really well put on. So I just wanted to. So thank you guys for inviting us to participate in, in uh, Earth Day this year. Um, one other thing coming up, uh, well, I'll wait for that. Uh, the only real ongoing project we have, this is kind of redundant, but uh, it's the TC NorCal project. Um, it is still, as far as the environmental process is, is on hold. Um, they're working through um, some lease negotiations. And um, so I don't really have any other update on that unless Jason, you have anything? No, not at this point, Jeff. Okay, so we'll keep that on the agenda. Um, we understand, you know, you guys put a lot of effort and time into the, the comments, and we want to make sure that we um, that we address those uh, in in due time. Um, the Delta Waterway cleanup day, we finally settled on that we're going to we've kind of expanded on the coast, coastal cleanup day, and we're going to kind of do these quarterly. Um, ESPE has been key in, in bringing folks and, and energy to this. And so um, the next one is going to be on June 25th from 9 to 12. We'll meet at the port uh, admin building and then head out to the site from there. We don't know what the site is at this point, but um, we'll have some th something lined up um, and work from about 9 to, 9 to noon. The first one we did uh, in October was really successful. And so hopefully we'll carry... Um, carry on that. Espe or anybody on the team, did you guys have anything else to add to that? No, just that um, from the last event that we had, it was very well organized and um, Jeff and the staff, you know, had everything out there, supplies, everything that you could think of that you would need to do cleanup. And so we had, you know, quite a bit in terms of, you know, volunteers that showed up. You know, we have a lot of the youth that are part of the uh, COVID outreach that we've been doing. So, and along with the um, the Native Council, you know, who was also brought a lot of their volunteers and youth. And um, again, for um, for any folks that are interested in participating, um, definitely the Port of Stockton staff has it all set up for us to make it easy. So, um, and you just have to put in the muscle component of it. So thanks for that. And, and we definitely, we had everyone from seniors um, all the way to, um, to youth that were helping with the whole process. Yeah, and I'm excited. A lot of our tenants have already kind of uh, shown interest. And so I'm, I think we're gonna see a lot more of our tenants come out as well. So very excited. And yes, Jonathan, I saw your, your uh, note. We will definitely share this. I think Julia's got it teed up, ready to go. So um, I think everybody will probably be seeing this pretty soon. Um, uh, the only, the only other thing really on, uh, on updates is that, uh, we did, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's Barbara. I had my hand up. Oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, one thing I just want people to think about from an environmental justice framework, because we are really going from a different principle <clears throat> with the, um, close to two dozen, um, university students that we're working with presently. A lot of times environmental justice communities will do a lot of photo opportunities around cleanup projects. Um, and what doesn't get tackled it, are the systemic problems that cause the condition for the cleanup. And this has been an issue that we have been working on the city, the county and the regional water board um, for some time. I think it would be really helpful if the port were to help us engage in some of those activities because there are things that can be done in terms of how waste contracts are managed by the city and the county, um, 
so that we don't have the level of dumping that we have. There are proposals that need to go forward in terms of enforcement to really get at systemic problems that cause the kind of dumping that we see. And then I just want to raise one other issue for consciousness. It is great for young people to do muscle work and do things for the community. But too often in disadvantaged communities, that is what our youth get called upon to do, but there isn't the investment in the intellectual or kind of workforce development training that um, takes these challenges and becomes career pathways or career opportunities. So I think this is great. I think it's great work everybody's doing, but it can't just become the photo op that, oh, we're out working with young people and here's how we're cleaning up the Delta because that will never solve any of the problems. And it also won't take this, this enormous talent pool that we have that is coming back to Stockton. I mean, we're interviewing people every day and the number of young people that we meet uh, from our disadvantaged communities who are finishing university, it's just mind blowing, the level of talent. And I, I wish I had three times as many places to put, put people. So um, I just want us to be mindful because we should not, you know, we always expect disadvantaged communities to show up to clean up the problem but you don't necessarily see that for kids who are from Brookside or from North Stockton. And I just really want to push that, you know, equity is about equity and opportunity as well as doing service. Yeah, I, we, I definitely hear you. Um, we, we are doing other things on the workforce development side. There's a lot of uh, uh, discussion going on and, and, and it's working its way into action with San Joaquin County Office of Education with Edison High School. Um, schools in South Stockton to be able to come out and have opportunity to see the types of jobs that we're providing at the port. Um, we're trying to work through kind of the legalities of, of getting them to come out uh, for different different um, activities to see, you know, at the port. But yeah, I understand, Barbara. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I, it, because, other, because I always fear that it becomes exploitive. The free labor, let's clean up the problem that we, the adults, have yet to solve systemically. Mm. It becomes kind of exploitive if, if it always becomes regular. I mean, so, you know, I'm really interested in hopefully that we're focusing on what those systemic changes are, because I'd rather have our kids ultimately focusing on the books, you know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I wanted to touch on is that uh, we were also recently back in, in Washington, D.C. We did submit a, uh, a grant application um, for the por uh, Port Infrastructure and Development Program. Uh, that's a MARAD program, and this is a, a grant opportunity to help support um, the grant, the, sorry, the rail hardening that uh, the port is looking to do to be able to move um, longer, uh, longer trains that will be more efficient and um, uh, Move goods, move goods more efficiently. Jonathan, I'm seeing your your comment as well. Contact from St. Mary's High School. Okay, that's great. Um, I will also be sending out. I think Jonathan, you had offered, and whoever else will offer uh, to 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 provide a support letter uh, to support our our grant opportunity as well. That'll be coming out to everybody's way. Re appreciate if if uh, you are so inclined to to support this project. Okay, uh, our next presenter, we're gonna go right into the Green Marine certification. Um, I'm excited to also let you know with, with uh, my recent discussions with some of our other tenants that uh, Metro Ports is joining the Green Marine program as well as, as SSA. And so um, I think that even for some of the port staff, it's kind of hard to understand what this program is all about. So we wanted to invite uh, Eleanor Kirtley um, and uh, who's with Green Marine and Randy Helland, who is a, a verifier to come and give us a presentation and, and uh, help everybody understand kind of why the ports uh, invested in Green Marine and uh, what it means to us. So, Eleanor. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thanks for everybody coming to the meeting today with your interest to learn about the certification program. Um, nice to meet your commissioners and more of the staff from the Port of Stockton. 
I'm based here in Seattle and don't get to travel as much as I would like, especially, of course, in the last couple years. Um, so this is really kind of a high level overview for all of you on the process and the certification. We're hoping to have a bit more of a dialogue, so please don't be shy about preparing questions. We should have plenty of time on the agenda with the 25 minutes allotted. And I think I've got some bonus slides in case there's even more technical bits that you're interested in. And I'll try and remember to pop some links into the chat. We've just refreshed our website and there's a lot of material up there that you're more than welcome to dig into. I am Eleanor Critley, the Senior Program Manager for Green Marine. I opened up our West Coast office in 2014 in Seattle. The program dates back to its founding in 2007 in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence region. So it's really kind of spread across the US and Canada over those last 15 years. And it's been great to see the growth on the US West Coast and especially in California. I guess we can go down to the next slide. So Port of Stockton joined in 2018, in fall 2018. And then in the next annual certification process completed those two steps, self-evaluation and verification to achieve their first certification. So now in 2022, this is their fourth year going through the process. And again, got verified to maintain their annual certification. Next slide. Kind of the elevator pitch of who we are is this voluntary environmental certification program that we're trying to foster a partnership across a diversity of our stakeholders. We're all committing to continual improvement and a culture of environmental stewardship, all trying to reduce the environmental footprint of maritime operations across North America. Next slide. This slide really speaks to that we are the most comprehensive environmental initiative to date for the North American maritime industry. And that's both by the composition of the membership and the scope of the issues covered within the program. That we are a program that is by and for the industry, for our participants, that we certify port authorities, terminal operators, ship owners, shipyards, and the seaway. So uniquely covering vessel side and shore side operations. But then we have three additional member categories of our partners, supporters, and associations to really represent the diversity of stakeholders with environmental groups and government agencies, making sure we have that right subject matter expertise to define best management practices and a standard definition of what it means to be green in maritime. And we cover a scope of 14 different performance indicators, broadly covering impacts to air, land, water, and communities. So each year our participants are reporting to those performance indicators, allowing for third party independent verification and the public reporting of those achieved results. Next slide. This is a map of our participants colored by participant types. You can see kind of like the breakout of mini maps around the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence and then growth around Eastern Canada. We have another, I have a counterpart program manager with an office outside of Halifax, growth around the Eastern seaboard, Florida, Gulf, and then West Coast. I think we extend south to San Diego and up through Prince Rupert. Next slide. This shows the growth of the program over the last 15 years, over 10% per year, bringing in more representation across these four member categories, participants, parts, partners, associations, and supporters. I heard that we have Environmental Defense Fund with us today. So wanting to recognize that they play a critical role in really informing that regulatory baseline and also the current latest best management practices, trying to find that right level of balance and difficulty to flesh out a progression towards continual improvement and environmental excellence. Next slide. This slide is really kind of like the nutshell of what we do. Um, the heart of our program is the certification. For our participants, largely it's a two-step process. Every year we kick off in January, looking back at the prior year's performance. So they've had a year or more look at that program's performance indicator. So now we are at 
the year 2022, we've released our 22 program and have just about concluded the assessment of 2021. Those results were due mid-March. Those participants who are due for verification, it's every other year. Those results, those verified results were due in early May. So what we're doing right now is collating all of those results from our participants to write our annual performance report. The latest available is the cover page you see on this slide for 2020. We'll then release the 2021 report at the annual conference called Green Tech that's coming up in a couple of weeks. We always host in June in a port city, alternating between the US and Canada in a beautiful location. And that's what we do every year. And then moving on to more of the scope of the program. I said we have 14 different performance indicators covering impacts to air, land, water, and communities. For an inland port, they're reporting to six different performance indicators. That's greenhouse gases and air pollutants, spill prevention and stormwater management, dry bulk handling and storage, environmental leadership, waste management and community impacts. And then in the 2021 program, we released a new performance indicator on community relations. In its first year in the program, it's optional for reporting, but I think about 80% of our participants still voluntarily reported to this new performance indicator in the program, released after two years of development, bilingual development, entirely English and French in the program. And then we'll get to release the first formal required results of that performance indicator on the 2022 performance come 2023. And as Green Marine is a dynamic and growing program, we already have another initiative in the works for our landside participants that's on aquatic ecosystems, looking at how ship owners address aquatic invasive species, how can we incorporate that into the land side of the program, looking at issues like biodiversity and habitat and water quality and the overall health of the nearby aquatic ecosystems of the port. Next slide. So for each of these performance indicators, we identify criteria on a scale of levels one to five. Level one is the same for all 14 monitoring of regulations. So is the participant aware of and in compliance with their local, state, federal, or international rules as applicable? Moving up to level two, where one Level two is required to achieve certification. That's that minimum performance level for a first certification to implement best practices, pretty mature prescriptive BMPs. That then to move up to level three, we might require all of the BMPs at level two, a formal management plan, an air emissions inventory, a quantified assessment of the impacts. And we can use that assessment at level three to set reduction targets and meeting reduction targets at levels four and five. Those higher levels are where we'll have more like capital intensive investments, new technologies, R&D, &D, creative partnerships that all kind of progress up to level five, representing excellence and leadership. Next slide. So we have our annual certification process that's focused January through June. And then complementary to that is our annual program development process, largely July through December. We have four different structured groups making recommendations on how to revise or add to the program to the performance indicators every year. So starting with the work groups, very specific issue specific with subject matter experts around the table, weighing in on the different criteria and the appropriate level of difficulty in the performance indicator They'll make recommendations to all the participants who have the opportunity to participate on their technical committees, who make recommendations to the advisory committees, four different regional advisory committees, West Coast, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, conducted entirely in French, and the North Atlantic is our newest regional advisory committee formed in 2020. Reaching consensus across all those bodies, which represents all four member categories and a verifier, we then bring those recommendations forward to the board of directors for their approval every year, where the board of directors is comprised of the executive level participants, also representing kind of the diversity of participants in the program. So across US and Canada, across land side, vessel side, et cetera. Next slide. This is a snapshot of what we get to report as results. 
So we're collecting information on level achieved one through five. Last year in 2020, we had nearly a thousand different performance indicators that we got to aggregate into one big data set and pull together kind of distributions as to percentage of participants reaching on average which level. So we can say that over 90% of our participants average at least level two across the board, all the way up to about two or 3% who are at level five all the way. On the right hand side, that's kind of like the history of results achieved that year on year as we're incrementally updating the program, making criteria and performance indicators above and beyond regulations as regulations themselves increase, keeping that performance steady so it still represents improvement as the program develops, and also trying to be not too hard where people have too low levels or not too easy where everybody has too high levels, but trying to find that right balance to keep everyone progressing and continually improving from wherever they're at. And then next slide, there you go. So the culmination of the annual process is our Green Tech Conference. The culmination of the annual cycle is the Green Tech Conference. We're coming up on our 15th conference in a couple of weeks, June 8 to 10 in Montreal. The last two years we had to pivot and be totally virtual, which was great for setting records in terms of number of attendees and number of exhibitors, but we really do miss like that in-person collaboration. So excited to be in Montreal in a couple of weeks. And then I will also very much invite you to join us in Seattle for Green Tech 2023, which will be June 12 to 14. And kind of a highlight here on the next slide are the results from the Port of Stockton. So not yet publicly released, but just having gone through the self-evaluation and verification process with Randy here are the 2021 results. You can see that there's two performance indicators that are up at a level five, that's community impacts and spill prevention and stormwater management. They've also voluntarily reported to the new performance indicator on community relations. So really doing an excellent job here. Oh, and I was gonna pop links into the thing. I did not do that at all. So what I wanted to share with you here that first link is to the whole 2021 program. So what you can do is you can see they achieved a level three in community relations and then open up the program and see what were all the criteria in levels one, two, and three that, that they reported to. And then each year we have our program development process incrementally updating certain criteria and performance indicators to go above and beyond compliance and reflect latest best practices. That new link is the program for 2022 that has already been delivered. And then I think this is kind of my main last slide. Basically keeping in touch with us is a great way to get involved. The easiest way to do that is to subscribe to the newsletter. We use our newsletter to promote information about the Green Tech Conference, like the call for abstracts will come out in the fall. We also have our Twitter, LinkedIn feed, our newsletter comes out about once a month and then our magazine has gone fully virtual and comes out about twice a year. And then the last slide is just like our contact info and questions. And I see we have a question in the chat or rather do ports do this as part of self-reporting? It was a two-part question. Um, one is, um, is there a process for the uh, 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 spillage, um, uh, discharge, emissions data where it is truth tested or verified by regulators as the outside source so people feel have confidence in the self-reporting process. Yeah, so we're uh, largely where that confidence and credibility comes from is the third party verification. So Randy will talk about his process and how he's gotten to know the port. And it is very specific in terms of like, we assess criteria 2.1, 2.2 2 and 2.3. Um, that part of their role is not a compliance audit, that that is level one monitoring of regulations, that the participant demonstrates that they're staying up to date and in compliance. Um, but it's the verifier who's looking at criteria achieved really in levels two through five as defined by Green Marine through that annual program development process. 
In terms of having regulator involvement, we know on the work groups and as much as we can on the advisory committees is where we're bringing in the subject matter experts and the government agencies really to inform that regulatory baseline that we have to go above and beyond. Um, for me on my West Coast Advisory Committee, that's largely through the local Coast Guard District. And then we also have EPA Ports Initiative that participates. I'm trying to get Ecology to come to my next meeting. Um, so yeah, this, I'll, let, I'll let Randy speak to his experience on verification and hopefully that will flesh out the process. Great. All right, Randy, you ready to go? Great. Good. Good afternoon, everyone, and I am absolutely honored to uh, to come speak with you today. And um, as Jeff mentioned, I was the uh, the verifier. I had the privilege of verifying uh, not only this year but the 2019 uh, did the 2019 verification for the Port of Stockton. Um, just a little bit about my background. I was in the, the U.S. Coast Guard for uh, 32 years. I was in the uh, the maritime safety, security, environmental protection. So I dealt with all types of regulatory issues, waterways management types of things during my Coast Guard career. Uh, I retired and I've been a verifier uh, uh, since 2012. Uh, so uh, going on going on 10 years. Um, what I like about the Green Marine Program, this is just me. Uh, what I like about the Green Marine Program is uh, that ports, terminal shipping companies uh, use a regulatory framework as a baseline and then uh, the different levels that Eleanor was just talking about is above and beyond uh, the regulatory requirements. So uh, that's that's what I enjoy doing. That uh, the um, the ports similar to Stockton are very serious uh, about all the different categories uh, within Green Marine, and um, uh, it's it's just uh, a joy for me to be able to walk through uh, where they're at with the self assessment and then to, to verify and to, uh, to discuss that with them. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit about the verifiers with Green Marine. Um, uh, all the verifiers have to meet a, um, a standard. Uh, they either have to have experience in, um, in maritime regulatory issues or surveys or that type of thing. Uh, so the cadre of, of verifiers that, uh, that are part of Green Marine, uh, are actually not part of Green Marine, but uh, available to do verifications, uh, have a wide background in maritime, uh, maritime issues. Um, the, uh, the thing is that all the verifiers are independent. Uh, we, we are not employees at Green Marine. So uh, while we get uh, selected and uh, as qualified uh, by Green Marine, we are not employees at Green Marine. <laughs> uh, we go through a yearly certification process. So once a year we get together, we have to go through the new the, the training, uh, what's new um, within the changes within the Green Marine. And then we, uh, uh, we are good, good for that year. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the process of, um, of the, what I would go through for a verification. As I mentioned before, all the verifiers are independent. So, for instance, the Port of Stockton would go through the list and, and they would select uh, whoever uh, the verifier they would want to do uh, their verification. And I was uh, uh, fortunate to do that. Um, once I get selected and they do their self-assessment, uh, I get notified that that has been completed. Uh, I can go online and review their self-assessment. And as part of that self-assessment, they have to provide all the documentation uh, required to substantiate uh, what particular level they're, they're, they're going for. So it could be uh, contingency plans, could be uh, uh, certificates, could be uh, results of sampling, uh, air sampling, water sampling, uh, a whole variety of things that would justify uh, them assessing that particular score for, for a particular category. What I do is um, I review that uh, quite a bit of time before I even get to, for example, the Port of Stockton. Uh, so I would do my complete document review. I go through the self-assessment. Uh, if there's any if there's any questions, I would go back to the port and say, could you clarify this? Uh, and I would do all that homework ahead of time. Uh, the process, once I get there, is uh, I go through uh, the, the self-assessment with them, uh, and we discuss the, uh, the documentation, uh, how they substantiate each particular category. <clears throat> and then we, at the very end of each category, we talk about next steps. And the reason I like this is that uh, it really um, 
uh, develops a dialogue of this is where you're at now and where do you want to be at the next verification, where we want to be next year. So we develop a roadmap of, of where they want to be. <clears throat> um, so I see this is very helpful. So uh, we would go through the self-assessment together. We would go through the documentation together. And then I would take a tour of the port and look at specific sites and specific things uh, per the, uh, the self-assessment form. <clears throat> we would go back and then we would have a, uh, a, a closing meeting, a, a formal meeting in which we would, we would agree on the scores uh, that would be uh, submitted as a result of the verification. Upon completion of that, I would go back and then I would uh, submit the scores electronically to Green Marine. Uh, I would follow up with, uh, with some documentation to, to the port itself. Uh, some, general, so, some general observations in my experience with uh, the Port of Stockton. Um, I think Eleanor put up that slide about what their scores were in 2019. Uh, to where they are at now in 2022 verification. What Green, is, what Green Marine is looking at and the goal is that process improvement, that gradual improvement over time uh, of in, in, uh, improving in either all the categories or, or some of the categories. So for example, um, since 2019, the Port of Stockton has increased in greenhouse gases. Uh, they've increased in community impacts and environmental leadership. So that's three of the categories that they've made significant changes and, and increases too. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's a very substantial, uh, very impressive uh, in, my, in my estimation. Um, some of the three of the things that really impressed me um, about the Port of Stockton, uh, one is that they're developing a uh, zero emissions footprint for the whole port. They're taking strides in, in making that happen. Uh, the second is that they have um, acquired the first battery electric locomotive rail car mover in North America. And that's a, that's a substantial uh, win, if, you, if, um, if I can describe it like that, for uh, environmental leadership. So they are the first in North America to do that. And then the last, which I think is very critical, is uh, what we're doing tonight, uh, the, uh, the Port Outreach Committee. Uh, there is uh, very few... Um, places that I've gone to that have ex had that have established a, a formal group like this to uh, to discuss what's going on, to get feedback from the community, uh, and to take action on that feedback. So uh, that, that is that is very very impressive. So my uh, I, I guess the what I wanted to communicate to you all is uh, I would consider the Port of Stockton uh, in the top tier. Of, uh, of ports and terminals and shipping companies uh, that, that I've had the opportunity to do over the past 10 years. Uh, there are initiatives in the uh, um, in greenhouse gases, in community impacts, community relations, um, and environmental leadership is, is uh, quite impressive. Uh, and what I, what I applaud their efforts to do is not staying exactly where they're at. Uh, they're always in a continuous pro uh, process of improvement uh, as they're going along. So um, that's, that's my general impression. Uh, that's kind of the process that I use uh, to, to do the verification. I would be happy to, um, to answer any questions you have on my, my past visit, my experience in doing verifications or any other topics you wanna to discuss. Sorry, Mary Elizabeth has a comment, um, a question. Did the port buy another electric locomotive other than that to be paid for by the AB 617? Um, yes, we, we, we bought a, it's not an electric locomotive, but it's a rail car mover. It's the largest electric rail car mover in the United States. Um, it's capable of pushing, I think 30 empty rail cars and 10 um, fully loaded uh, rail cars. So, and we've been, we've had that in operation for the last, I want to say about 16 to 18 months. And it looks like Barbara has a question is. is yeah, I mean, let me just summarize it. Uh, you know, I think this is a high level report and I think it, you've made tremendous progress and it's wonderful. I think though, there needs to be more in-depth review with communities of the data. 
okay? Um, and the reason why is for a self-reporting entity to come out with a report card that says, yes, we're now up to level four and we've improved, it doesn't kind of have the rigor so that you know that there is appropriate verification going on between the verifier and the entity. And I, you know, I keep going back to you want to make things radically transparent um, to really build confidence with the community that progress is being made. Understood. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the uh, this is not the only thing that we do, but uh, this is kind of uh, one of the the opportunities for a third party to come in and take a look. But uh, yeah, we can talk about that further, Barbara, about what that might look like. Listen, sure. I know it's not the only thing you do because you've put the water quality data up. You've been reaching out to, um, uh, you, you know, you have Ellen now joining up with the HAB subcommittee. So you guys are making tremendous progress. It's really uh, appreciated. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not just pushing you to, to just to be squeaky about it. Um, what I'm saying is that there is a real difference when industries self-regulate versus when you have a government regulator working on behalf of people. And this is the one you put up on your website. This is the one that is digestible for people. This is the one that people look at real quickly and look at an infographic and say, oh yeah, our port's doing the right thing. So what I'm just saying is it does, you know, it doesn't have to be constant or outgoing, but maybe when you go to publish every year, maybe you do a briefing with the CV, CBOs where you have more of the geeks, more of the people who delve into data, and you sit down with them for two hours and you do a review between Randy's work and what you've self-reported uh, and walk people through who kind of watch those things for the community. Because then, th then there's a, a confidence level where people can say, yeah, it is looking good. They are getting it done. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. And, 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 you know, I don't even think there's even an issue with, uh, you know, us inviting other folks to our verification meetings and then kind of having you guys sit there and go through some of that too. I don't know if other, if that's been done before, Eleanor, but um, that's not something that I'm opposed to necessarily at all. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the various different elements of how Green Marine staff does QA and oversight on the verifiers and the verification process. I mean, one element of that is the opportunity for a program manager to shadow and come along with the verification. I haven't heard of participants welcoming other community members for the verification taking place, but we have done things like I'll come and present at a commission meeting alongside the port staff going through the results and really kind of opening up, this is what we achieved, this is what we're looking to improve to in years in the future. Um, so less of like a, a real time back and forth of, can you please attach me the file for the justification of criteria 2.4.1, but more kind of the afterwards, this is what we were able to get done um, and looking ahead, but yeah, I appreciate the openness. You would, you know, you would know better how to do that because you also then walk a fine line because, you know, community groups also only have expertise up to a point. So, um, you know, you can't get bogged down dealing with groups that don't have expertise to do a certain level of an analysis that is required by your experts. So that there's, there's some kind of just like, um, gray area between the two where you have to, you know, whether it's a, a day of someone doing some of the process verification with you from some groups or just really sitting down and just doing a deeper dive into the data once a year, twice a year, based on how you do your self-monitoring. Um, you know, groups also get overworked with meetings. So, it's hard to find a balance, but I just think that, you know, if you take the time to really just once in a while do the deeper dive, that, you know, that may be enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will, uh, yeah, we will take that into consideration and, and uh, continue to, to improve. And, and yes, um, thank you for your mention of, of uh, Ellen and, and that other work. She, she was going to come. She'll come when as needed um, when she has updates. She didn't have anything this this month. And what we're talking about here is the port's participation in a harmful algal bloom study um, this summer. 
Uh, sorry, we got to kind of move on quickly. I'll, I'll real quick uh, answer Fern's question um, about the zero emission footprint. What it is, is um, we're working with the California Energy Commission to develop a zero emission uh, or a electric vehicle blueprint um, that'll really help guide the port's efforts into bringing in additional um, zero emission equipment um, that it sh we're hoping is gonna be kind of a, a plan for, um, for the port and for other municipalities and other ports that they can take and use to, to kind of uh, start to, to move towards zero emission. And then Mary Elizabeth, you have a quick question? I lowered my hand. Okay. Thank you. I, I just had a question. I got confused between uh, electric locomotive and a rail car mover. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to move in. Uh, Jolene Hayes with Farron Piers has got a quick update for us, I believe, on the traffic study that we're working on. And just for everybody's information, the traffic study is really focused on ways that we can get port trucks, you know, more out of the, you know, we've already taken some steps. We've gotten additional access to um, the port by the extension of the Highway 4, but there's still one portion of the port that um, has to go through some section of the neighborhood. And so what we've asked Jolene to do is really take a hard look and figure out um, how, uh, what ways we can do that to get the trucks from transiting next to the elementary school and going through the community. So Julian, if you can give us an update. Sure. Make sure I am sharing the right screen. Is everybody seeing the right screen? <laughs> I hope it's, you're seeing where it says these complex zoning, correct? I have two monitors, so sometimes I'm not- Use sure. complex zoning, yes. Okay, great. Um, and I think this is kind of actually touches on something that Barbara brought up earlier with enforcement um, and a lot of the dumping that happens out in this area. And this um, kind of shows why that, that might be happening. There's three different jurisdictions that are all within this area. So the green is the port's boundary. Um, everything that's kind of in that pinkish color or kind of a peachish color is the city's boundary. And then this purple area in the center of Box Tract is actually county. So you have, it, it's, even, it's really difficult to even tell when you're within Boggs Tract, which jurisdiction you're in because they all three butt up against each other. Um, so whose responsibility it, is it to go up and, and enforce or clean up an area becomes murky. Um, I think that's also part of why we have some interesting land uses in here. So I'll show you the next one, which we did some digging into what the the land use designations are, and these aren't necessarily, for the most part, they're pretty accurate with what, what's out there as far as um, land uses that are on the ground today. Uh, some of the places where we found some inconsistencies were down on the south part of South Ventura. So that's where on the east side of Ventura, you do have some truck or trailer parking that's happening on some dirt lots. And that's within the county's jurisdiction. It's unimproved um, so that it's not permitted. But um, that's only a, a piece of the story because you can see this orange that, that comes in here, that's, that's all industrial, um, general industrial land use. And that's where a lot of these new truck facilities are popping up over here along Ventura. Um, you have some interspersed single family residential zoning, which is all the yellow. So Ventura is, is probably as much of a problem as the, the port's east gate, which is this diamond up here is the east complex entrance. Um, this other dot right here at the north part of Fresno, that's the entrance into Penny Newman. Um, just real quickly on, we looked at port 13 as, as, a pri as an original option and the port was trying it to see what would happen if they routed some of the trucks along Washington and into the East Complex using North um, Port Road 13. Um, as, as I mentioned, that's only part of the problem because the trucks that are enter entering Penny Newman and also serving this area over here would still have to come through somewhere. Um, but just to give you a sense of what the truck volumes are on the main routes in and out, well, first I'll talk about trains and why Port Road 13 didn't work very well. Um, there's on average, 
40 to 50 trains a day crossing Port Road 13. And you can see that some of those delays when those trains are crossing, we've seen delays over an hour, um, meaning the crossing is completely blocked for up to an hour. So it, it's not really a great solution for moving trucks across Port Road 13. What we think might be a better option is, at least in the short term, like I, I mentioned last time around, is looking at Ventura and Washington and at least trying to move the trucks to the extent possible out of most of this area and seeing if we could bring them up through Ventura and across Harbor this way um, into Penny Newman and into the East Complex. And that would allow them to still access over here. The part that we need to work with still is figuring out the best access here. Would it come through Harbor Street and they could access this area over here without going through Fresno? So these are kind of the next steps, be thinking out loud of, of what we're going to be investigating as we go forward. But just to give you a sense of some of the track activity that we um, collected over, we took a, a week's worth of data. So Fresno on average has about 5,200 trucks. And this is um, between, this is just south of Washington where we, we took this count. Half of those are trucks. Um, Washington Street from Fresno to Harbor Street. So just that little sliver only has 2,700 vehicles and only 30% of those are trucks. So Harbor Street is really used primarily for probably the workers and for the residents to access the box tract area and the port complex. Um, Harbor Street, again, really, really low, 500 total ADT once you get beyond Fresno, and then 35% of those are trucks. So the majority of what we're seeing is, is really on Washington, and we're, we just collected some additional data this week at the intersection of Ventura and Washington Street. Um, I haven't gotten the results of it yet. I saw an email come through yesterday, but um, depending on what that shows and what I'm assuming is going to show up in that data is that we do have a lot more truck activity um, at that intersection than was originally anticipated just because of all those truck serving uses along Ventura. Hmm. And I think I can get out of here, stop share. There we go. So that's the latest and greatest. Um, any questions on what we're seeing out there? Mary Elizabeth has something in the chat. I don't know if. Uh... Yes, I, I put this is from the uh, one. So everybody went to Washington uh, a week or so ago and were uh, advocating for different projects. And this was one of the one voice projects. Yes. And I'm just wondering, you know, like how how this effort here, you know, uh, works in with your study. And, you know, if, if this is like contingent or um, this is something, you know, that you guys are, yes, this is going to happen and um, we'll work through whatever happens with, you know, that increased mobility and how does how does that how does that play out with this problem that uh, that you have in regard to the Port Road 13, which I was unaware that there were, um, you know, trains that essentially idling. Yeah. For over an hour. Is that is that correct? I'm not sure. Are they do they turn off all the way when they get stuck like that? That's an anomaly. I'm not sure exactly for the the one hour what what that is. I mean, we're we're there all the time. We don't we don't see trains blocking roads for one hour. If if they are, they're getting uh, a lot of calls from um, port staff to to clear road crossings. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that could have. What's that? It was really early in the morning too. That what it looked like it happened at about four a.m. So it could have been them building a train. Could have been um, that. In that crossing. So could have been a, a derailment. Traffic, you know? They have derailments occasionally. Um, but so, 15 to 30 minutes was pretty common. And I think that was building trains possibly, or if they're taking apart, you know, if they're decoupling or coupling trains. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the Washington Street widening project is really so what we've got going on right now is is obviously we would not we're not planning to widen within the neighborhood. It would only be from you know the where the port uh, property is. And what we're seeing now is is Port Road uh, Washington Street has got rail track um, just to the south of it, parallel. And so if there's trucks trying to turn right to get into businesses, um, occasionally they are blocked off from turning uh, because the, the railroad is, is, is blocking the road right there. And then you get just back up, you get back up all the way. People can't even pass them. It's a two lane road. And so cars and trucks are just backed up behind it. So um, widening that to at least have some sort of a passing lane is something that uh, we really, we're really interested in doing and just making sure we don't have uh, trucks and, and, and passenger cars backed up for miles. Does that answer your question, Mary Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, I think uh, if there's no other questions, thank you very much, Jolene. Looks like Jonathan has his hand up, Jeff. Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, can, you, can I see a map on exactly where the widening would be? Because I'm trying to get a feel when you talked about the railroad tracks and I mean, I think we could just utilize the same one was used you want me to just pull up the screen again? Yeah. Because I think I, I'm pretty sure I know exactly where he's talking about. Do you know where the railroad tracks cross Washington Street? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, that, that's about the extent of it. So right here to the east, right? Yes, just between just between um pretty much where the admin building is and where it where Washington connects with Navy Drive. Cause you see, uh, you've got rail oh, right there. You yeah, see, yeah. there's you see, there's rail just south of 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 uh, Washington Street. Mm -hmm. That sometimes blocks the traffic if, if people are trying to turn right to go down into those other businesses. Which that that makes sense if if there is some of that. What well, we we caught in the data with the cameras, um, if some of these trains are taking longer to get around. Um, and that's causing some of that delay that we're, we're capturing at Port Road 13, but that same rail traffic could be blocking Washington from time to time and causing those backups on Washington. Is that mm -hmm. what you think is happening, Jeff? Well, also just see the, the rail that's parallel just south of mm -hmm. West Washington. So sometimes there'll be, there'll be a train there that wraps all the way around. Uh, yes, that whole section. Okay. So. Double whammy. Yeah. So, okay, well, we appreciate that and uh, we'll look forward to getting another update as we get more additional information. So thank you, Jolene. Sure. And then Renee, I know that you've, uh, you've joined us. Thank you so much. Um, Renee's with uh, Starcrest. They're helping us with the clean air plan development and um, she's gonna give uh, our May update. Um, so take it away, Renee. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about cargo handling equipment. This is just a reminder of where we are in the process. Um, we're going to be finishing up the individual source categories next month with ships and rail, and then working towards a draft clean air plan in August. Next slide. So um, a little bit of information here about the terminal equipment in Stockton. There's about 100 pieces of equipment that includes port owned equipment of which a majority of the equipment is owned by the port. Um, it also includes equipment owned by tenants. Most of the equipment is forklifts. There's also loaders, bulldozers and yard tractors. And then the information below is um, looking at terminal equipment in relationship to other sources from the emissions inventory 9% of the port's nitrogen oxide emissions, 8% of particulate matter emissions, and 13% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So not the biggest source category, but um, something we definitely want to take a look at. Next slide. So one of the really encouraging things about the Port of Stockton is the major investment in zero emissions equipment that's already happening. So between um, the Port of Stockton and one of the major tenants, um, SSA Marine, 
there's 40 pieces of zero emissions terminal equipment that's either in demonstration or it's pending delivery. That's about 40% of the fleet, which is sort of incredible for ports um, today because it's still emerging technology. And these graphs are showing what the impact of those zero emission pieces of equipment are gonna be. So once it's all deployed, we will see particulate matter reductions of 62%, nitrogen oxide reductions of 64% and greenhouse gas reductions of 32%. Next slide. There's lots of opportunity coming up for terminal equipment. Um, the California Air Resources Board is working on amendments to the cargo handling equipment regulation. Um, probably starting later this year, working on that regulatory amendment and the they have signaled their intent to phase in zero emissions. And there's also a lot more options for zero emissions technology. It's advancing rapidly. There is a lot of funding available for zero emissions terminal equipment. And probably uh, the most encouraging um, piece of all of this is that the port owns most of the equipment directly and has contractual relationships with the other equipment owners in the form of leases and other types of agreements. And so we've got a real opportunity to make a significant dent in the emissions with terminal equipment. Next slide. So we wanted to kind of run through a couple of the ideas we've been thinking of in terms of strategies for the clean air plan. Um, again, with the, the state working on amendments to the, ca the cargo handling equipment regulation, it's a really good opportunity to accelerate whatever timelines that they come up with, um, which we still need to figure out what those are as that regulatory process moves forward but we will be looking to accelerate state regulations. So among the strategies is making sure that the port goes after grants to buy zero emissions equipment and can help the terminal operators also secure grants for their equipment. The port, um, and Jeff had mentioned, this is working on an electric vehicle blueprint to identify the actions needed to support zero emissions equipment transition. So that's underway. Um, and then really working with the tenants making sure that for their facilities, they are taking the steps necessary to make sure that they are able to start using zero emissions equipment as soon as possible. And then um, in terms of other strategies, um, a goal of transitioning all port owned equipment to zero emissions by 2030, or in advance of the state regulation, whichever is earlier, if it's feasible. And the reason the feasible is in here is because there are not zero emissions technologies for every single piece of equipment that's being used at the Port of Stockton. Um, some of the types of equipment are just farther along than others, and we might be waiting you know, five to 10 years for some other types of equipment to become zero emissions. So we wanna make sure that whatever the port invests in, it's feasible for the operations, it can handle the performance. Um, but that is that would be the goal. Um, this is the proposed strategy, making sure that the port owned equipment goes to zero by 2030, and that beginning in 2025, all new equipment purchases will be zero emissions if the technology is available. So that means that if there's a piece of equipment, a forklift that's at the end of its useful life and the port is going to replace it anyway, Beginning in 2025, if there's a zero emissions option, the port would invest in that as a replacement. And then for the tenant owned equipment, the goal would be to help them transition to zero emissions by 2035 or in advance of the state re regulation, if feasible. Um, any comments or questions? Uh, on these strategies, the, the last slide is really just letting you know that next month we're going to talk about ships and, and rail. So if there's any comments or questions about these strategies or any of the information, I know I kind of went through it quickly, but um, happy to answer any questions. So this is Margo. Um, can I, are you, you okay with me? Go on ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so these dates you have here, so uh, setting these um, criteria zero emissions by 2030 or beginning in 2025. These are dates set by the port. If a state regulation comes in, then that will, and it's earlier, that'll take precedence. But if it's not earlier, then your date will stand. Is that what I'm hearing? 
Right. right. I mean, that's that's the idea, Margo. Exactly. Go ahead, Renee. No, that's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Davis has his hand up. Yeah, thanks uh, for the presentation, Renee. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned that there are some technologies that are not readily available or, or easy to transition to zero emissions. And I was just wondering um, what you were specifically referring to. So equipment like the loaders and the bulldozers, that's going to be a long ways away in terms of zero emissions. There's a lot of advancement on forklifts and there's a, there's a big spectrum of forklifts. There's forklifts that are heavy forklifts that lift really heavy loads and there's others that are lighter. Um, and the port's been demonstrating that type of zero emissions equipment. And, and even the ones that are out there today still need a lot of work to be able to handle the, um, the types of different types of operations at the port. So forklifts are farther along. Um, there's a few yard tractors at the port of Stockton and there are some zero emissions options in demonstration. It's really um, the very heavy equipment like the loaders and the bulldozers, um, which there are not too many of, but those are gonna be a while. Yeah, I think there's only, I think we only have three or four operating at the port, but but yeah, we've been we've been looking Davis and um, trying to keep our eye and, and reaching out and the, the technology just isn't quite there yet. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah, can I just ask a quick follow-up? Sure. I'm wondering if there, it, was there like a, a total cost determined for how much a, a zero emission transition of the current equipment would cost? Or maybe to be more nuanced, maybe the current equipment where there's, where you did identify that there are um, pretty readily available technologies to do so? We have not come up with a total cost to replace our fleet yet. That's kind of... Uh something that um, I'm, I don't know if we planned to go through that exercise, Renee, but uh, it's something we, we can do, but it has not been done yet. Okay. I think that may come up with the blueprint that, um, that Stockton is working on, that zero emissions transition blueprint, that cost would be um, a factor. And remember also that it's not just the equipment you also have to put in charging infrastructure to support zero emissions, if it's battery electric or some type of fueling infrastructure, um, if it's hydrogen. So there's that to think about too. Thank you. Okay, right. anybody, other, any other hands? All right. Well, thank you, Renee. We appreciate that. Um, and then the other person we wanted to, to present today, kind of following up from, um, you know, finding all this equipment and funding, we wanted Todd to kind of provide us with an update from the Air District's uh, side of things and what, what funding they see out there and opportunities to partner with the port as well. So, Todd, if you can give us a quick update, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Thank you, Jeff and, and commissioners for the opportunity to, to join the meeting today. Um, really appreciate the discussion. A um, lot of great things going on at the port. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, and, and Renee, her, your presentation was a great segue into kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, and, and that's how we can help um, in some of these plans to transition um, to cleaner equipment um, in and around the port areas. Um, my name is Todd Young. I'm the Director of Grants and Incentives for the, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. Um, we cover the, uh, the entire Central Valley um, from San Joaquin County um, down to Kern County. Um, and one of the, one of the um, uh, main strategies of the Air District um, to attain um, state and federal air quality mandates um, is through the use of voluntary incentives. Um, for the past, you know, 30 years, we've been we've been a regulatory body, and we've been regulating uh, businesses, including the port, um, and limiting the emissions um, to the extent that's that's feasible. Um, and and we're getting to the point where um, regulation alone isn't going to get us to where we need to be, and so we need to start looking at ways that we can voluntarily move the needle. Um, and reduce emissions. Um, as a local air district, um, mobile sources are not under our authority to regulate. 
So cars and trucks and trains, um, those, those things really um, are regulated by the state and, and federal government. Um, and so again, um, the way we are um, making those changes is through the voluntary incentive programs. Um, and that's, that's for, you know, it, that's everything from um, um, uh, a rebate for a new electric lawnmower um, all the way to, um, you know, if you're replacing your vehicle with an electric vehicle, we have rebates available all the way up to um, replacing entire fleets of trucks, school buses, locomotives, um, a lot of the, the types of equipment we've been talking about here today. Um, the Air District um, in our upcoming budget um, includes um, about $565 million um, in potential available grant funding district-wide. Um, that's, a, that's a combination of multiple different sources, federal funding, state funding, as well as locally generated funding. Um, as you can imagine in the Valley, we focus heavily on, on agricultural sources. So we've got um, a lot of different programs for agricultural sources. Um, we do um, a lot of uh, truck replacements, um, tractor replacements, a lot of agricultural equipment. Um, and again, um, through the AB 617 process, and I see a lot of our partners from the AB 617 process on the call. Um, great to see everybody here. Um, we really focus a lot on the, the community level um, resources, things like um, tree planting, vegetative barriers, um, replacing wood stoves with natural gas, um, those really those, those more community level and community driven actions that are going to um, benefit the residents of the AB 617 community. Um, and so what I wanted to just just really introduce myself today and, and talk about, you know, some of the incentives that we do have available. Um, and we have been involved with the port. Um, we've been doing, we were involved in funding um, part of the demonstration of some of the, um, some of the cargo handling equipment out there, the zero emission, uh, the Danner um, equipment that's out there. Um, we have replaced um, several switcher locomotives and we're actually eyeballing several more switcher locomotives to replace. Um, really the, the, what we focus on is, is replacing older diesel powered equipment with, with either new clean diesel, um, but, but more of these days we're really, really pushing towards um, zero and near zero emission technology. So that's, you know, the battery electric stuff and, and um, some of the ultra low NOx natural gas equipment um, are a lot of the things that we're focusing on. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, let you guys know that we do have incentives available um, and it sounds like there's a great partnership opportunity as the as the port starts to implement um, their clean air plan over the next several years. Um, I think the district can be integral in providing um, that that funding mechanism to maybe accelerate a lot of that equipment turnover that we're talking about. Um, and and even if we don't have the funds available for, um, you know, say a demonstration project, we'll go out and find it. Um, we're, we're really good at going out and looking for um, whether it's state funding through CARB or federal funding through EPA or um, um, uh, CEC. Um, we're very successful in, in um, uh, getting demonstration funding. So some of that equipment that may not be available today um, that we talked about, you know, if, if there are opportunities in the next couple of years to demonstrate uh, the feasibility of some of that equipment as it, as it comes to market, um, you know, that's certainly something that we <clears throat> that we would be interested in. Um, some of the programs that we have open, you know, just immediately, um, you know, we have uh, truck replacement programs where we provide, um, if you're replacing an older diesel truck um, with a new battery electric truck, we can give you up to $400,000 per vehicle um, for a battery electric truck, a little bit less if you're going to that, that uh, near zero emission natural gas technology. Um, we have funding available. Um, somebody mentioned um, that uh, one of the important aspects is, is not just the equipment itself, but the, the fueling infrastructure. Um, we do have funding available in this next year's budget for fueling infrastructure. Um, we, we just went through a process and we're, we're actually going to contract right now with several um, um, electric and natural gas fueling infrastructure projects valley-wide, um, and we're going to be opening up another solicitation. So. Um, plugging into some of the air districts um, grant programs, I think, is going to be key. I know Jeff and, and Jason and, and the folks at the, the port have been very, um, you know, um, 
uh, very plugged into kind of what we're doing here. We we have you know very very regular contact. So um, I think as as um, you know the port moves forward with its clean air goals, um, we can we can assist and and um, you know realize the the clean air goals for the entire valley um, by doing some of these things at the port. Um, and then you know obviously those are are going to be things that um, you know directly affect. Um, the AB 617 community as well. So, you know, the, the more that we can do to clean up this port equipment, the better. Um, we're, we have funding available for locomotives, um, both line haul and switcher locomotives. Um, like I said, we've, we've funded several um, in and around the port um, over the past couple of years. And we're actually in, in conversations with, um, um, with a couple more um, owners of, of um, switcher locomotives to, to replace those. Um, so we're hoping in the next several months to actually be moving forward potentially with, um, with more of those. Um, electric rail car movers are something we're, we're, we're definitely interested in if there's an opportunity, if the, if the port was looking to, um, to potentially replicate what they're doing um, with the zero emission. Um, rail car movers definitely um, something we'd be interested in in looking at a potential partnership. Um, other off-road equipment, um, um, and again, the, the cargo handling equipment to the extent that it's available in zero emission um, configurations, we're definitely interested there. Um, we have we we cobbled together a, a variety of funding sources, and so it's just kind of um, figuring out what's the best fit for any particular project. Is kind of that's that's what we do. Whether it's state funding, um, you know, the, the color of money is always is always something that we have to concern ourselves with. And you know, every funding source, you know, has has requirements that need to be followed. So, um, what I wanted to stress today was was you know, give us your ideas, give us the your priorities, give us your you know what you want to target over the next couple of years, and then let us help you find you know the right funding source for that. Um, the money's out there um, and it's available. Um, it's available right now district wide. Obviously, there's eight counties in the valley. Um, so a lot of this funding is competitive. Um, but to the extent that um, you know that we can that we can focus some significant funding in the port, I think that's something that we're definitely keenly interested in. Um, and, and so my contact information is here. Um, you can certainly contact me directly. Um, the, the two bottom links there are, are to our um, grants website. You can kind of check out all of the different grant programs that we have available. Um, and then if you just wanted general information about our grant programs, the, the grants at valleyair.org is just a general email address. But, but please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to kind of um, you know, walk through any of our grant programs, what the requirements might be, um, you know, funding timelines, you know, all, all of those sorts of details that would, that would need to be fleshed out. Um, so with that, I, I, I just, I'd like to open it up for, you know, any, any quick questions. I know we're, we're kind of almost out of time and I appreciate everybody wants to go home and, um, but, I, but I'm, I'm certainly available to answer any questions and, and I'd love to hear ideas for, you know, potential partnerships. I'll leave it anybody in the group first. Doesn't look like anybody. Well, I can tell you that um, you mentioned our uh, our rail car mover, and that has been kind of the star of the show as far as um, what we've brought on board in the last couple of years. And I know that uh, of anything, that's that's one thing the staff is pushing me to go after um, another rail car mover. Um, another thing, we just went after some CEC funding, the Energize program, to get additional charging infrastructure. Um, we did not respond quick enough. It's just almost like the old days when you would have to call into a radio station and try to win the prize. Right. Um, apparently, we, we did not make it in time. But um, So we are looking for additional charging infrastructure. I think we've got 30 charging units at the port, and we started off with 36 forklifts, zero emission forklifts, and then SSA just got another dozen. So yeah, we're starting to quickly outnumber our, our charging infrastructures as well. So um, that's exactly like, that's that's what we'd be really interested in. Great. Fern, um, you had a question? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Todd. 
No, I was, I was just going to answer the the question in the chat, Jonathan, um, and, and I appreciate you reminding me. Um, so, in terms of of uh, tugboat repowers, um, we have yet to do one. Um, they're eligible under the state guidelines. the The Carl Moyer program guidelines is one of the one of the larger state programs out there. Um, and we would love to 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 learn how and and figure it out. Um, you know, a majority of the valley we don't we don't normally um, do a lot of marine projects. But um, if if there was an appetite in and around the port to do one, um, we would we would absolutely love to entertain that and and uh, figure out how to make that happen. So it, it's definitely eligible. A couple of months ago, we had Kevin uh, from Brusco Tug come, mm -hmm. and they have been repowering a lot of their tugs. They have. They haven't done a zero emission tug yet, but they are interested in potentially partnering with us to 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 make that happen. Okay. Um, so we are we're we're just trying to get through our budget season yeah. right now, and then as soon as that gets done, we'll kind of uh, attack this a little bit um, more vigorously. But um, that would be great, and and having the willing partner, the port doesn't own any tugs, the port doesn't mm -hmm. own any trucks, and so having a willing partner is one of the toughest parts of this whole thing. So um, they are definitely uh, willing. So Fern, you had a question? Yeah, um, I actually had a similar question about tugboats, but some others too, but just on tugboats, um, I wonder if it would be great to explore potentially doing some kind of outreach um, and sort of um, collaboration with tugboat operators, just given the hovercraft rule just passed earlier this year. And once um, you know the deadline hits, then they won't be eligible for the funding, right? So mm -hmm. it's actually a really good incentive for them to try and turn over sooner than later um, to be eligible for, for the funding. Um, so that's just a flag. Um, but I was wondering about the locomotives and no, and and what tier of engine um, the ones that you've been repairing um, move to. Um, great question. And so we've been doing primarily um, some short line, um, short haul locomotives. And it's my understanding, and somebody I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong, but um, a couple of, at least a few of the ones that we've done were were tier zero or, or uncontrolled. Um, these were, you know, uh, 1950s and, and 40s vintage locomotives, um, and they went to kind of the latest tier, um, the latest tier locomotives. Thank you. And I guess one last question, if I may, um, I was also wondering about um, sort of the onshore powering um, for ships, because I think that remains the biggest source of emissions for most ports, um, including Port of Stockton. It is, it is, and it's gonna be our toughest nut to crack. I can tell you that. We're, we're, we're talking to some companies. There's a company in Austria that we're talking to that, that potentially wants to demonstrate a bonnet uh, capture and control system um that's probably our only way we're going to capture marine emissions at in stockton um the ships that come to the port just do not have the capabilities to plug in most of them i think it's 70 percent of the the ships that come to stockton only only have one call uh in stockton per year and um yeah, the, there's a lot of tramp vessels. There's not a lot of liner service. So it's great when you do liner service, you get the same vessel comes back every time and there's incentive on the manufacturing side to, to you know, build these ships with uh, or to put um, electric capabilities within them. So we're really looking at um, at a bonnet type system. And so we're, we're watching. Uh, there was two that were certified by CARB in Southern California. I believe there's only one at this point. Um, and I, we've gone down to see it a few times. It's, it, I think they're struggling a little bit, but, um, I also know that Wainimi and I believe San Diego are getting ready to install, um, bonnet type systems. So we're looking at the companies that they're, they're, uh, utilizing, um, somebody just needs to kind of pull the trigger and, and really be able to show some success doing it honestly is what is where we are with that. So we, we, we would love to do it ahead of the compliance date, which for Northern California is 2027. Um, and that was even one of the measures that we put in for the AB 617 funding. 
um, that was at least from my perspective, the biggest, uh, the biggest need um, and the biggest bang for our buck and being able to reduce emissions for, for South Stockton as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I know we've talked in the past about um, future uh, agenda topics. And so I just wanted to throw it out to the group to see if there was anything that we have been missing that uh, you guys would like to, to put on the agenda to dive into um, for in the next couple of months. I will tell you that I've been talking to SSA who um, I know that they've spoke, spoken to us before, but they are running um, electric trucks between Oakland and, and I think Tracy. Um, they're having some challenges, uh, but they are doing it. And so I wanted them to kind of talk and, and kind of help us to understand uh, what their experience has been with uh, uh, putting um, electric trucks to use. Davis says energy and storage planning, workforce development. Okay, workforce development be a good time. We did just sign an MOU with uh, Stockton Unified um, to support the STEM program. Um, so we will have a little bit of meat to talk about there. And uh, so, yeah, we can definitely do that. Thank you for that, Jonathan and, and Davis. Was there any other thoughts or ideas? Yeah, Jeff, this is Margo again. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned, and I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about your vision. Uh, you talked about it at the start, the rail hardening that's going on, and you expect longer trains, which would be more efficient. Um, but what's the vision behind that? What, what kind of loads would they be carrying? Um, and you know, when, when we, we first became acquainted, it was um, around the coal um, transport and issues around that. What did, what do you, where do you see the port going at this point in time? And, um, and how do you see that rail hardening uh, making a difference? So the rail hardening is going to be for bigger bulk type projects on the West Complex. The, I can tell you that the, the rail hardening will not benefit the coal operation whatsoever. They just, uh, they have a very small area. Um, so like the Denmark project, um, you know, soda ash, something like that out on the West Complex, bringing in 150 to 190 car unit trains. So this is, that is what we're this is strictly within your boundaries of the port. It is. I, there may be there may be a little bit onto the lead of, of uh, the NSF, but it's yeah, it's all rehabilitation within within what's already been built at the port. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. And uh, Jonathan, yes, invite the SUSD. Are you talking? The, the guy I'm working with um, primarily over is uh, SUSD is Nathan Haley. Is that who you were referring to, Jonathan? Yeah, I have no idea who he is. Okay. So that's why I'm thinking it'd be great to, because there's a lot, there's a lot of workforce development being discussed. And I know, yeah. um, you know, I, I want to make sure we get a face to be able to also connect on all, all, all other things as well. You bet. Okay. All right, well, if nothing else, then I just wanna thank everybody for, for being here. Um, feel free to reach out as always. Uh, we're doing additional tours. So if you know anybody else who uh, is interested, I know that there are, and Jonathan, you, you have a lot of contacts with the newer AV617 folks. We'd love to get some of the, the those new faces to come out and uh, start to develop a dialogue with them as well. So um, feel free to, to reach out anytime and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.